influence of the drug in that turkey. Oh. <laughs> I keep forgetting what I ask every meeting. What do they, what do they call it? Tryptophan? Tryptophan. Yeah. Trip, trip 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 wow, tryptophan. All right. How many of you are still under that influence? That's what I thought. I have a few little signs here that I liked. Either you like bacon or you're wrong. <laughs> that's, that's not a good way to start this meeting, is it? <clears throat> what do we learn from cows, hippos, and elephants? It's impossible to reduce weight by eating green grass, salads, and walking. <laughs> uh huh. That works. This was in a, apparently a church bulletin. There will be a talk entitled From Cannibalism to Christianity, followed by a Finger Foods. <laughs> Not a well placed announcement, I, I agree. People need to learn the difference between want and need. I want a nice body, I need banana pudding. One last one. You're all aware of the romaine lettuce scare? Right now, donuts are healthier than romaine lettuce. I've been waiting my whole life for this moment. <laughs> That's funny. That is funny. All right. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. Why don't you open your Bibles, please, to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. The five scariest people I, I met in my life, the most terrifying people I've ever met, were all bitter. I think the most terrifying vice or iniquity is, is the vice of unforgiveness, bitterness. I don't know anything that, that destroys and ruins a life quicker that in some circles is commonly accepted as a, almost a virtue. Uh, some people call it discernment. Um, bitterness is always justifiable to the bitter. There's always reasoning behind resentment and bitterness, unforgiveness. My favorite virtue is thankfulness. Thankfulness has... Um, Goodness, it's almost like it insulates a person from things that would normally contaminate or cause a person to stumble or hurt or whatever it might be. It doesn't mean it keeps us from pain. It just keeps us in a place where we're healthy. It's, thankfulness is so bizarre that you can eat a, put it in, old, in a uh, early New Testament context, uh, being invited by a neighbor then offered their food to demons uh, a meal that could possibly hurt you, if, uh, if you're invited to that meal, it's actually possible for that meal to be sanctified by the Word of God and prayer. And in the context, the prayer was the prayer of thankfulness. Thanksgiving actually decontaminates that which was uh, set against you. The whole issue of thankfulness in a person's life, but the, if I could go to the opposite extreme, my favorite virtue would be thankfulness. My, the scariest uh, vice or iniquity is, uh, is bitterness. I've, I've worked with uh, people for a lot of years in uh, pastoral ministry, counseling, that sort of thing. I'm so glad I don't counsel anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, there's a song in my heart going on right now. I, we don't have time for it, but oh, it's there. It is there. But I used to counsel, and I don't anymore. I don't know if I mentioned that, but I don't <laughs> counsel anymore. I'm going to forget what I'm talking about because I'm so thankful. I'm just so thankful. I'm insulated from everything else right now because I'm so thankful. I, I, you, you hear the, the, the question, can a Christian have a demon? Um, I love John Wimber's. I think it was John Wimber's answer. He says, I don't know why you'd want one. They make horrible pets. 
<laughs> Seemed to be the most reasonable answer to me. Um, but this, the, the scripture actually gives warning to believers, don't give place to the devil. So the point is, as a Christian can give uh, a place of influence to the enemy. And uh, Paul in Ephesians 4 warned against giving a place of influence. And I, I've watched uh, in, the, in the groups of people that I've worked with for the last 40 some years, the three areas that open people up to the demonic the, the most, from my opinion, my perspective, is uh, drug abuse, specifically hallucinogenics, uh, sexual immorality, especially perversion, repeated, and the third one is bitterness. And the three scariest, uh, five scariest people I've ever met in my life were all had one thing in common. They were, yeah. they were uh, bitter beyond reason. And all bitterness is beyond reason, but these people were possessed by this spirit of bitterness. Uh, two of them, uh, one of them I worked with here in Reading, tried to get him free, but he just, he, just, he just refused. And then one in Weaverville, they both are in prison for murder. Uh, they both killed people after, after they rejected um, the... Uh, trying to get free from the issue of bitterness because bitterness is actually the spirit of murder uh, in diapers. It's just undeveloped murder is what it is. And it, whether it actually becomes a violent act or not is not the point. It's what happens in the heart of the person who is embittered and unforgiving. The scariest part of the whole issue, the subject of unforgiveness to me, uh, we're going to read about it in a few minutes uh, when we get to Hebrews 12, but it's, it's this statement that unforgiveness defiles. So if you could picture this, this is the person I'm bitter at, I'm the bitter person, this is the person I'm bitter at. What happens is unforgiveness, bitterness in me defiles me, it defiles everyone under my influence, and it does nothing to the person I'm bitter at. It's the craziest thing, it's like, it's like, uh, uh, it's, it's like drinking poison, somebody said it's like drinking poison hoping somebody else will die. You know, it's, bitterness actually destroys the vessel that it's in. And we are redemptive people. I don't, think, I don't think there would be a bitter person on the planet if we saw how undeserving of forgiveness we were from God and he forgave us. I don't think it's possible to see how undeserving I am and he forgave me. How much more must I forgive, even in, in life's worst situation, forgive. Forgiveness doesn't mean to um, trust again. Trust has to be earned. Forgiveness doesn't. Um, Jesus taught several things about forgiveness. The Apostle Paul taught several things that I think would be worthy of note. Um, one is that forgiveness, we receive forgiveness according to the forgiveness we give. The prayer that we love so much, on earth as it is in heaven, it concludes with this statement that we are forgiven according to the forgiveness that we give to others. I, I saw this video, it's a very sobering video of a gentleman who was, who was raised from the dead. And, uh, and he was, he was abs absolutely terrified from the experience because of where he was going. And, uh, and, and this story about this man who had been raised from the dead, he was so paranoid of conflict. And I don't mean that in a, in a wrong way. I, I just want to describe the situation. He was in his home. When an argument would start between two family members, he literally would get up and run and hide in the bathroom. He would hide because he, was, he saw the effect of bitterness on eternity. And it so terrified him that he would run and he would hide. And yet bitterness is something that people broker in all the time. In fact, it's, uh, it's become uh, empowered, accentuated, emphasized uh, in the political conflict climate that we live in right now. I, I do believe, you know, we say that God is not Republican or Democrat or Libertarian or Independent, Socialist, whatever you want to fill in the blanks. He, I, I get that. He's not. Um, the question isn't whose side is God on. The question is, 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 are we on his side? Because he does have things that he despises and loves. Uh, Mike Bickle uh, made the best statement for me, helped me uh, understand so much. He said, God's anger is always aimed at whatever interferes with love. And our, 
the scripture says we're to be angry and sin not. So this whole notion of the Christian becoming, coming to a place where there is no emotion, that's Buddhism. That's not Christianity. That's Spock on Star Wars. I don't, I don't want to be like Spock on Star Wars. Who? Star Trek. Star Trek. Thank you. You know what I meant. You know, Spark on Star Trek. Yeah. They're all the same. So, I, I just, now you have to forgive me. You have to forgive me now. Believe me, I've made much worse mistakes than movies. I, I, I tend to forget. I sit on United Airlines and I turn a movie on. I, if I last five minutes, it's almost a miracle. I just, I go, ah, stupid movie, change it. Ah, oh, dumb movie, change it. Oh, this is going nowhere, change it. <laughs> Never mind, all right. So Spock on Star Trek. Yeah, got, it. got it, all right. He said, be, Scripture says, be angry and sin not. The emotion of anger is natural. If you're not angry at certain situations that rise up in your life or in society and culture, something's broken. It just can't lead to sin. It can't lead to resentment. It can't lead to bitterness. It can't lead, lead to a self-promotion, vindication, uh, re, you know, uh, retaliation. Be angry, it's a sign you're alive. If you see a child abused and you, you don't get angry, then you, you, you're dead. There's, there's something really wrong because that, that is supposed to provoke, provoke anger, but also it's to put us into a place where we become redemptive solutions. Redemptive solutions, listen, if I am bitter, my volume increases, but my influence decreases. Bitter people lose trust quickly because everybody in society and culture is looking for people to trust. We vote for this politician. We choose this measure. We move into this neighborhood. We put our children in this school. It's always an issue of trying to find where can we set our teeth into a place of trust. And bitter people are not trustworthy. So he says, he says um, be angry and sin not. But then he follows it with this statement in Ephesians 4. He says, uh, be angry and sin not. Then he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. So here, here's the deal. We start the day with what Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What is it? At the beginning of my day, I have determined to live redemptively and I, before I am sinned against, am prepared to forgive. It's, it's the commitment, I am going to live the life of a forgiving person. It doesn't mean abuse is wrong, doesn't mean lying, stealing, doesn't mean any of that stuff that is done to you, to me, doesn't mean it's okay. It doesn't mean that stuff's fine. It just means I am not going to become controlled by the sins of another person. I'm not going to let the spirit of bitterness dictate to me my thoughts and my feelings. I will rise above these circumstances because I'm going to be a contributor to society. What happens when I'm filled with bitterness? I'm holding on to the past. If I hold on to the past, I cannot hang on to the present and bring redemptive solutions. It's one of the things the enemy uses to keep us away from being a creative positive influence in culture and society is to keep us married to yesterday. If, if, I am, if I am bound by the effects of yesterday, then I have really lost my ability to have positive effect on the world around me. So we, we have this commandment to, to not let the sun go down on our anger. Here's, here's another one. Uh, the, uh, uh, John the Baptist made this statement. He says, bring forth fruit of your repentance. Bring forth fruit of your repentance. There has to be evidence. When we claim spiritual realities, it has to be measurable in the natural. Jesus said, if you say you love God who you can't see and you hate your brother who you can see, you're a liar. Because claiming an unseen reality has to be measurable in the natural. It has to be, it has to be uh, realized in the natural. It has to have an effect. If, for example, 
if I am bitter at somebody and I forgive them, it has to, my behavior towards them has to change. Now, as I said earlier, it doesn't mean if there's an abusive situation, if they've stolen or they've done whatever, it doesn't mean that trust is rebuilt. It just means as far as it depends with me, I am living in peace and I'm not being controlled or manipulated by the circumstance of, of being hurt, uh, abused, whatever the situation might be. So we have this issue of not letting the sun go down on our anger. So I start my day as a redemptive person that today I've determined I, before anything happens, no matter what happens, today I'm going to live as a forgiver. I'm going to live as a forgiver. I'm going to release people. I refuse to be bound by bitterness through the actions of other people, number one. But then I'm going to make sure that at the end of the day, I don't let the sun go down on my anger. I may be experienced frustration, anger, because this happened, that happened, this was wrong, that was wrong, but I'm not going to let it control me. So at the end of the day, I've got to make sure that I go to sleep with peace. If I don't, then that thorn of unforgiveness gets under the skin, it fouls and festers, and it gets woven into my personality. It gets woven into my consciousness, into my thinking. It becomes a part of the fabric of who I am. The longer I leave it there, the more it begins to define me. Jesus wants us to have every day with a fresh start where we become true uh, contributors to society. Yeah. And we can't do that under the influence of bitterness. I remember years ago, I was, I was counseling somebody. Have I mentioned to you I don't counsel anymore? <laughs> oh. Let's just sing a song right now, gratefulness to the Lord. <clears throat> there is a song in my heart. I want you to know that right now. I'm experiencing great joy. Anyway, I was sitting with this couple <clears throat> in counseling a long time ago. She was mad because he had done something 10 years earlier. That's a lot of suns going down on anger. <laughs> And uh, so uh, we, we're, they're friends, so we're, we're talking, and I found out she's been carrying this for 10 years. I said, all right. So I looked at him. I said, did you ever repent for what you did? He said, yeah. And uh, I said, well, where's the evidence? Now, that wasn't an accusation. It sounds kind of harsh, but it was we're just in conversation because the scripture says, bring forth fruit of your repentance. If you don't have, if your internal decision doesn't affect your behavior, you have no evidence you've forgiven right? If it, doesn't, if it doesn't affect behavior, then it's just a philosophy. He didn't call us to a philosophy of forgiveness. Yeah. He, call, he called us into a lifestyle of forgiveness. It has to be proven through action. So I said, do you have any, any evidence? He said, no, I don't. I said, all right, well, let's meet again next week and just bring me some evidence. So a uh, week went by, they came in, I sat down, I looked at her, I said, is there any evidence? She goes, nope. I looked at him. I said, do you have any evidence? He says, yeah. And he began to make this list and her eyes opened up and she realized that she had become the problem. He caused it, but because of bitterness, she extended it. Does that make sense? Let me re rephrase this. Her bitterness blinded her to the reality of his repentance. Wow. See, bitterness distorts view, perspective. It distorts, it poisons how we view not just the situation of the person who's hurt us, but life in general. Life in general becomes interpreted through my history of pain, through my history of pain. So now I'm actually, even if I'm not in unforgiveness, if I've held on to these things, these issues of past pain, if I've held on to them, even if I'm not a bitter person, they still shape how I view present situations. And in order for us to be instant in season and out, for us to be redemptively uh, functional in any and every situation, it means yesterday cannot have lasting influence on my life, except for what Jesus has done. Back to the story. So I said, do you, do you have any, any, uh, any uh, evidence? He says, yes. And he began to make a list. And she realized that he was correct. He did have evidence for his forgiveness. The point is, when you forgive somebody Embracing a philosophy of being a forgiver is not going to fix a problem. But when there are measurable actions, maybe it's that you take a day to fast and pray for that person. Maybe, maybe you make a phone call. I remember 
I remember making specific phone calls uh, to individuals that had really had hurt me, and I would call them to bless them or to honor them or in some way serve them, and, and it hurt so much inside, but the only thing that hurt was the part that was supposed to be dead, so it wasn't that big of a deal. <laughs> yeah, don't protect what should be dead. submit it to the obedience of Christ. Submit it to obedience, to actions of obedience. So here's the deal. If I'm forgiving this individual, then I need some behavior changes. Maybe the person who abused me, you know, let's say I was abused 20 years ago, they're, they're dead. Well, I can't do anything to them or for them. But you know what I could do is I could pray for the blessing of God on their descendants. In some way, put into an action Maybe fall to my knees and just pray, God, I don't deserve, maybe that person is, is, uh, lives on the other side of the planet, but you come before the Lord and you say, God, I know that I did not deserve your forgiveness and you forgave me. I ask that you would give that same mercy to this individual that hurt me. What I have brought into my life as a, as a regular discipline in recent uh, months and year or so is Benny and I like to take communion often. And I've already taken you through this, at least many of you in, in part. <clears throat> but we like to take communion often, most every day. And when, I, in fact, I, I had it this morning. Uh, Eric and I both come early, early morning, five, five-ish, five, five to 5.30 to come and just to pray, to get ready for the day. And so I like to bring communion with me uh, so that I can pray. And what I do is I pray over every member of my family. I make confession of the Lord. Uh, by his stripes we are healed and pray for those who need miracles. I pray, I hold the blood up before the Lord. I make the proclamation, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I remember each, mention each family member. I pray for them uniquely, individually. But then I move into the area where I pray for those whose ministries, they actually have taken a position to oppose me or to uh, publicly uh, write a book or maybe they... Uh, um, have conferences uh, to undermine uh, us, me. Uh, maybe they, they tear apart or critique or criticize a book I've written or whatever it might be. Fill in the blanks. They've taken public position to oppose me. I've had uh, them meet me at the airport when I land here. I've, I've, I've had just weird situations, protest banners out in front of conferences that I do. It's because they love me so much and they just don't know it yet. <clears throat> And Chris, uh, one of them, Chris was mad because my name was on the protest board and his name wasn't there. He was, he was a little, he was a little, little upset over that. But anyway, um, there are five people on my list, three who are, are who are recognized around the world, who have taken this position to oppose me. You never criticize a servant to that to that servant's master. There's no right. Uh, never does a believer have the right to accuse another believer before God. We don't have that right. So what I do is I bring their name before the Lord and I pray. I ask God, uh, this morning I prayed, God, I pray that they would lack nothing, that everything they need in life, whether it's finances, whether it's favor, whether it's open doors, because they do preach the gospel, uh, uh, open doors for, uh, for the gift that you've given them and pray for the blessing of the Lord on them. But the thing that I love praying the most for them is that, Father, I ask that you give them the joy of having children who have children who would serve you wholeheartedly. That they would have the privilege of children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren that would serve you with all of their heart. Give them that joy and that pleasure. What you've got to do is you have to have evidence that an internal decision has been made and is carrying out. And sometimes it's prayer. Sometimes it's a gift. Sometimes it's a phone call. But it's something that we do just to make sure, as the scripture says, so far as it depends with you, be at peace with all men. Do everything you can possibly do on your end to stay undefiled by the spirit of bitterness. Amen. We haven't got to Hebrews 12 yet, have we? Just trust me, it's good. <laughs> Let me make one more comment, then we'll read this. Because of the politically heightened conflict that exists in our country right now, we need people to hold to righteous values without becoming bitter. 
And one of the hardest things in the world to do is to minister to a group of people without picking up their offenses. In fact, let me make two more comments. It's challenging. Listen carefully. It's very difficult to give yourself to minister to a group of people without picking up their offenses. For example, it's very difficult to minister to the poor without being offended at the rich. It's very difficult to minister to the rich and not be offended at those who don't work. It's very difficult to minister to children and not be offended at adults who don't prioritize the life of a child. It's tough to minister to adults and not be offended by a younger generation that shows them no respect. It's difficult to minister to one race without being offended at another race. The list goes on and on and on. And sometimes people's ministries are defined by what they're offended at instead of the actual ministry of the gospel. I believe that God has, he cares about the issues that are at stake in any of our nations represented in this room. He doesn't have opinions. He's right. And like, was it, was it Joshua that saw the Lord and said, whose side are you on? And the angel of the Lord says, whose side are you on? That's the real question. <laughs> Having said that, I don't think on many, many issues the enemy cares what your opinion is as long as you leave the character of Christ to defend it. In many areas of our life, I don't think the devil cares one bit about what your convictions are regarding an issue, as long as you leave the character of Christ to defend it. Hebrews 12. You all right? We almost have to end, and I'm finally getting to the Bible. Oops. All right, verse 12. Hebrews 12, verse 12. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather healed. Pursue peace with all people. Man, I love that. And holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I have that phrase underlined. Without which no one will see the Lord looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. You know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Don't skip the sobering passages of, passages of Scripture. Don't skip them. Don't, don't just read the verses that make you feel like the king of the earth. Read the things that cut deeply because we need them. The fear of God is a huge part of our walk with Christ. And uh, this is part of it. So verse 15, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. This phrase concerning bitterness and many being defiled has been a phrase that has been racing through my mind for several weeks. And I've been looking forward to today. Uh, Happy Thanksgiving, by the way. Looking forward to today. (laughs) I am thankful, but... I'll be more thankful when, if you're not bitter, you know. <laughs> it's been racing through my mind in recent weeks because I can, I could see, I could feel and see <clears throat> the defiling effect of bitterness of a person on another person. <clears throat> and where the Lord is taking us is deeper into places of service, of love, of care, of influence. 
but we can't survive it if we don't know how to resist picking up the offenses of the people we love and care for. And by many, by it become defiled. I was uh, just talking with some friends of mine uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we were able to spend some time together, and they were they had a some some sort of a birthday gathering or a holiday gathering. I forget what it was now, and uh, and something in the food didn't taste right. Every everyone just went ahead and ate it, even though it didn't taste right. And then it hit. Everyone, everyone got food poisoning. Everyone but two people. Everyone got food poisoning that ate this stuff. Uh, and many were defiled. <laughs> and if you eat the meal of criticism and accusation, you're being f- food poisoned. And so the Lord, here's, here's, my, here's my, if I could pray one thing for today, it would be either that we'd be ridiculously thankful and or we would become allergic to bitterness. Yeah. You'd break out in hives or something. You'd start twitching. I don't care what it is. But in some way, you begin to manifest when you get around bitterness because it is that defiling. And to see the effect of bitterness on the human soul, to see the effect on a family, I realize there are horrific stories represented in this room that what you've gone through is beyond words. I've spent enough time one-on-one with people to know the things that some people do to other people is just, is just crazy. It's just stupid. But there is no liberty for you outside of forgiving. There just isn't. There just isn't. We become defiled by our own Uh, entertaining thoughts of accusation. Paul made this great statement in Philippians 4. I'm sorry, I should be giving you references, and if I had my act together, I'd have verses on the screens with the references, and and you would be all the smarter because of it. Philippians 4, verse 8, he says, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, uh, all these, think on these things. And if I'm struggling, does anybody else ever have accusations about somebody else come to your mind like a thousand a minute? Maybe not a thousand, maybe just a hundred a minute. The accusations that come, if you don't, if I don't, if I don't proactively counter that, not by rebuking, but by replacing, he can only plant a thought where there is no thought. I have people that have, have really affected my life in not a positive way. And yet I know that they have a relationship with the Lord. And what I've had to do is come to the place where I actually fear Christ in them so that I maintain awe and respect for them. Jesus has redeemed them. He has changed their life. He has forgiven. They're not perfect, but neither am I. And we rub each other the wrong way, something happens. Those thoughts bombard the mind. If I can't get victory that way by praying aggressively for them, not against them, then I just turn my attention to my wife because she's everything on Philippians 4, verse 8. She's lovely. She's of good report. She's all the things listed. So I just think about her, and I'm delivered right there. It just comes right out, and I'm okay then. So uh, whatever works for you, you can think about my wife too if you want. Go ahead. (laughs) What I can't afford to do is to spend time thinking something that has the potential of setting down roots in me and shaping who I am. Listen to me. Bitter thoughts are not okay. They're not okay. Because it's what precedes imprisonment to something that destroys us. I say this because of my, I'm concerned with what I hear and see. I've 
taking time to reflect over what I grew up with, what, watching what happened with people that I tried to help counsel that went and killed somebody and just crazy, crazy stuff. The two that scared me maybe the most were the two people in a church that I would go to serve. and They were, they were just possessed by bitterness and resentment. And they, they could not reason. I don't, I don't see that here. But I, I also know that you and I are made of the same stuff. And if, they can, if somebody else can do it wrong, then I can do it wrong. And so I want to make sure that I, that I have the tools in place where I can walk in forgiveness, walk redemptively. And the, the answer is not creating a big defense. The answer is offense. A good offense is the best defense. Keep the ball out of the hand of the enemy. Just, just, don't, just don't give him a place. Don't give him a place. He has no right to set up influence. So here's the deal. I'm praying that everybody in this room would become allergic to resentment. That the discernment level in your heart and mind, in my heart and mind, would be so heightened that if we get near it, we automatically come in redemptively knowing we cannot afford to be influenced by this that is sent from the powers of darkness. Yep. <clears throat> My hope is is, is not, I, I, I seldom think of survival. I think in terms of overcoming. I, you know, I, I don't want to be the last one standing. I want to be a part of an army that actually made a difference. And so, obviously, I, I don't want to see people fall to that spirit of bitterness, fall to that control. But more than that, I want to see a redemptive army be thrust into deeper and deeper places of influence, people who know how to forgive. You know, you read the quotes of some of our nation's heroes through the years. You read the quotes. I'm sorry, I've got them in my iPad. I, I didn't think to bring them up but quotes from Martin Luther King, some of his statements about forgiveness, very profound statements. The place of influence is really given to those who know how to forgive. And I pray that for you, I pray that for me, that the Lord would continue to thrust us into places of influence because we know what it is to walk as a redemptive army of forgivers. Why don't you stand with me? We're gonna to pray together. <clears throat> You know, my dad, <laughs> let's do this. Let's, let's just assume no one in here is bitter at anyone. Amen? Amen. Amen. No one. But if you were, does anyone come to mind? <laughs> oh, that's so funny. No, no, no one. No one. No one. <laughs> My dad used to have this statement. He said, when you wash another person's feet, you find out why they walk the way they do. Some people you may be offended at that you wouldn't be if, if you figuratively washed their feet. Find out, oh, that's why they limp like they do. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. So, Father, <laughs> make us allergic. <laughs> Let allergies spread through the room right now, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? I do pray, Lord, I pray for a great grace to live redemptively at a level that's beyond anything we've known. You've, you've lifted the veil, so to speak. You've let us uh, have places of influence and to serve and to love well. And I just ask, God, give us discernment. Give us a grace in every environment to be able to be an influence of forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Now, I'm going to ask everyone, please hold your place. Bethel family, hold your place for you. Because I want to give an invitation for people to know Jesus 
And I don't want to do that with people walking around because it's too easy for others to be distracted. The greatest miracle that could happen here today is that somebody would say, I want to know what it is to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to know what it is to be forgiven by God and to walk as a forgiver. If there's anybody in the room that just say, Bill, I don't want to leave the building until I know I'm at peace with God, I've been forgiven of sin, then I want you just to put a hand up where you are. We're just going to make an agreement with you. We had five people, first service, respond to this invitation to know Jesus. Is there anyone this morning in this service? Just put a hand up. I want to make sure that we give full quality time for you to come to know the forgiveness of Jesus. For those who are watching by Bethel TV, we just announced to you the forgiveness, the grace of God is available to you as well. And I do pray that you and I would be able to spread the forgiveness of Jesus through all through our city this week. I just pray for that great grace. Amen. Amen. By the way, uh, in another two weeks, is it? David Hogan's going to be here. That's going to be wild. That's going to be wild and crazy. That'll be a great fun. Brace yourself for that one. Who's coming up now? Tom, you are? Why don't you hold your places and let Tom here uh, bring this to an end while I get to the back door. Come on, so good. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to pray for, let's just do this. If you're here right now and you've ever struggled with unforgiveness or bitterness, just raise your hand. All right, you're, you're, you're in, you're, we're together, okay. If you're here right now, though, I just want to pray for you right now if you're here and you're, I'm not, I'm not going to have you raise your hand. I just want to pray for you where you're at. God knows where you're at. But I want to pray for you if you're just really, you've like some, had something happen to you and you've struggled with unforgiveness still and um, you just can't shake it. You know, we just want to extend grace to you right now and mercy. And so just, if you could just bow your heads and close your eyes and just receive, Lord, we just release grace supernatural grace to the person right now who's just been battling it a long time. Lord, we just release grace, and we just say right now, be loosed from this unforgiveness, and, uh, and we just declare grace in that situation that you would be free to walk free from what's hurt you. Yeah, we just look to the cross and the blood where forgiveness was purchased for all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ministry team, if you could begin to make your way forward right now, we want to pray for you here. Maybe you're here right now and, and that prayer just touched you. I would just encourage you to come forward and let somebody just agree with you in prayer and cover you and, and let them just minister to you right now. But we want to pray for you if you need um, a miracle in your body or uh, just something in your heart. We want to just minister to you right now. And I just declared that this holiday season would be the greatest season of joy ever in your life. And maybe if you're here right now and it's not been historically in the past, it's a new season, it's a new day. And uh, so bless you with the joy of the Lord, the joy of the holiday seasons, that Christ would be the center of it all in Jesus' name. So we'll see you tonight. Have a great day. Come forward if you need prayer. Minister team, if we have... Uh, school